welcome to the Blood and Pigment podcast. This is episode number th- uh, three. You got it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I was. I was almost. I was calling this episode number four for a long time because of the episode zero. But uh, we've got with us today myself, Garrett Swader, and I have Dan, Yo, and Joseph. Hello, hello. And we also have special guest Tyler Stone with us. Hey, everybody. In this episode, we're going to go through some Adepticon stuff. Just kind of going through a preview of that. Get stuff out there for everybody, as in like what we're doing, what's, what's planned, stuff like that. And then we also have Tyler... Tyler, who's going to Adepticon, is going to help us with that. And Tyler is also going to do a segment with us on how to run a demo. But for right now, I'm going to throw it over to Dan. Uh, what have you been up to, Dan? So just painting and waiting for my World War One Russians to get here from War Games Atlantic. I have 70 models coming in that I am actually excited to kind of paint for my tourney list. In the meantime, I've been painting up some War Games Atlantic horses for my... World War One Russian Cossacks to go on top of. I finished them today. I used a really nice silicone brush set that my fiance gave me to put the mud on. And then this past week, I actually ran two demos at my local game store. It was pretty cool for Blood and Plunder specifically. Nice. Yeah, and he's actually coming back next week for a demo, the same guy. So he's going to come back for a C demo. He's going to let me know what nation he wants to play. And I'm going to set him up with a list because he wants to buy the... No, it actually, he did buy, I believe, the um, starter set. So I'm going to make him up a thing of 24 minis and kind of let him know if that's the, if this is what he likes to play. Here is, you know, how to kind of break up the units and kind of do most of that legwork for him. Yeah, we'll have to come around to that and again in the second half of the episode and tell us mm-hmm. how you presented the demo. I know, I'm not revealing yeah. all my secrets yet. Oh, yeah. <laughs> as a demo veteran. Grizzled veteran. Mm-hmm. But you may be entitled to double the compensation soon. Hell yeah. (laughs) All right, so Tyler, what have you been up to? I've been testing out what list I want to take to the C tournament at Adepticon. I didn't know until kind of the last minute or something this size that I was going to be going at all. Uh, And I was in touch with Mike and everybody, and I was able to open it up that I could get there. So I didn't have anything prepped for this list. Uh, I don't have any events in that I'm running, so I will probably be on the demo table all weekend. And I just requested specifically that if I don't get to participate, I at least get to watch the Blood and Valor stuff, and that I wanted to definitely participate in one of the Blood and Plunder tournaments. And C games are kind of my jam, so that's where I went. I'm eager to see how this tournament turns out. There has been a lot of smack about this is really good or too good on uh, Discord the last year. So I'm eager to see what people actually bring and what comes out as uh, winning lists. Yeah, Tyler actually helped me with my list because I needed a direction and sent and said, hey, what, what do you think of this? And then he helped me kind of whittle it down, which also means he probably knows what my list is, which means I'm going to show up to play him and he's going to blow me out of the water turn three. But it's okay. If I'm running the tournament, I'll be sure and match you guys up in the first round. Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I can do that. That was <laughs> That's always fun, too, when someone comes in and they start playing with a group. Like, when Joe came and was playing at Historicon, we had people coming up and they're like, I really want to play against Joe. <laughs> but some overly smart person decided that the two native players who were rooming together should play against each other on the very first round, which is very rude. I don't know if that was intentional or not. I honestly was not privy to that conversation at all. I had nothing to do with that. (laughs) Somebody did. (laughs) Everybody will need to watch Tyler when he sees my Filer minis on the table and watch his eyes pop out of his head with the sheer amount of models I'm bringing. (laughs) Yeah, it's going to be a wide variety of lists on, on all those tables. It's going to be fun. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested to see that, too. Hopefully, we're, we're still kind of working out who's going to be running that one. I may be on the hook to run that one, but if I'm not, I will be playing in it. And potentially, I'm, I'm going to move on into what I've been up to, as long as Tyler's finished. Oh, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry I didn't okay. hand you the football. No, nah, that's, that's fine. I was, I was moving things along. But yeah, I'm currently painting a galleon which I may or may not have a list for that potentially would be for a C tournament. (laughs) 
it's I, it's coming along pretty well. I should be finished with it in a couple days of of working on it. But yeah, and then I I was working on a display board. We're going to try to have a display board going for Blood and Plunder in the in the area that we're running games. And I've got a 3D printed uh, Castillo de San Marcos uh, that I've finished painting. And it's completely done now and ready to set up on a display board when we get there. So I think I, I think really I threw cool. some pictures in of it uh, already to our discord here. So, but yeah, I'm, I'm proud of the way it came out. Should look, should look pretty good. I was hoping, I was actually hoping back when I started that project, I know they have some kind of army display board competition at Adepticon, mm-hmm. but then I learned that it was like 40 K only. And I was like, well, Darn that I would have I would have entered that maybe in that if uh, if it was, you know, any game fair. Yeah. <laughs> Just tell them your guys are space brains out of the armor. It'll count. Uh, maybe I've walked through the hall where they hold that event. It's they usually do it before the very large official tournaments mm-hmm. and people go ballistic on those boards. I mean, there are ones that are Pretty like nice. several feet tall. I wouldn't have probably touched a win in that but i was just thinking oh we could get a blood and plunder army out there for people to look at you know and mm-hmm. be like oh is that a thing anyway and then uh, next week i am going to saint augustine to participate in my first reenactment so that's that's Ooh, pretty cool i'm yeah. jealous of that <laughs> yeah, yeah hopefully it's hopefully it's fun um i've got most of my costume and kit Already so you never purchased. call it a costume. It's not a costume. Well, I'm it's your impression. I'm, I, this is my first time. I don't know what to call. I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to help you. It's okay. Okay. You have to All post right. some pictures in the Discord. I want to see this. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. I will. I definitely will. But yeah, it's Searle's raid in St. Augustine that I will be at. So, are you being the Spanish? Or are you being the op- the opposition force? If I can be the Spanish, I will be. But I don't really care all that much. I know the group I'm going with, I think most of them are English. So I might just lump in with them. Yeah. But Joseph, what have, what have you been doing? I've been busy. been working on blogging stuff for Blood and Pigment. Um, just got uh, your Mission Garrison article up. I uh, got some fun pictures for that. Um, and that was a good article. Thanks for writing that. No problem. Spanish Mission Garrison is a unique force. And got a faction review up on the blog there. I've been get, supposed to be doing pictures for Dan. How long have you had that uh, article written, Dan? Dutch Marine? About a few. <laughs> About a few, yeah. We've been revamping all the nation review articles. I wrote a series back in 2020. Can you believe that? <laughs> Four years ago. Going over kind of what makes each nation in Blood and Plunder special and unique. And then a quick overview paragraph or two on each of all the factions in that and the game has grown a lot since 2020 so i'm going back through those and rewriting them all which is a lot of work so i got the spanish one done and the native american one done and still got five more to go so that's and then the painting contest log stuff trying to keep up with that entries and updates and stuff for that so that's keeping me busy i've been painting a little bit uh, i painted a couple oak and iron ships which i haven't done for a while I don't know if any of you guys have messed with the Siocast Oak and Iron ships yet. Um, they have some quality control issues. The Siocast <laughs> molds seem to be finicky or wear out quickly. I'm not sure. <laughs> They're going to try to sell those Siocast machines, aren't they? Didn't that, isn't that what they said? That's the rumor. Okay. Anyway, uh, these I think the casts are really nice, <laughs> except for the messy spots. But they're so much more detailed and easier to paint compared to the soft plastic ones. I've been painting the Galleon and that third rate the Ann English third rate and having a lot of fun with them. It takes so long for one model, but I was really happy with one that I worked up. So that's been fun. I got an Eberville, my second Eberville model almost finished painted up. Um, but it's been nice to get a couple evenings of painting. I got this uh, battery that holds like four stone battery holds like three or four heavy cannons that uh, Jamie Martinson has uh, built a STL file for them trying to get painted and flocked and, fancied up to look good so some crafting stuff there i've been working on adepticon scenarios too kind of fine-tuning them but we'll talk about that later 
and I've been reading, getting a lot of reading in lately. Um, I finished that book. I think you were working on it. How far are you on the Raiders and Natives, Gary? Oh, I've I've not gotten to it yet. It's on my to read list. I'm a slow reader. Some of the stuff can be pretty heavy going. But yeah, that was a pretty good book. Raiders and Natives cross cultural relations in the age of buccaneers. Not too big, but it's still 120 pages. That's uh, it's mostly early or uh, mid to late 17th century. Uh, talking a lot about how the English and Spanish both interacted with the natives and kind of the dynamics of the relationships and the changing dynamics and how the Spanish kind of changed their way of interacting with them when they saw that the English were <laughs> making friends with them. And some good history uh, I've been working on. Some 1660s Christopher Mings and Granada campaign stuff, and this uh, applied directly to that. So really good find. Thank you for <laughs> showing me that. Here. No problem. We can do a full review when you, uh, you finish it. <laughs> I, I think I picked that book recommendation up from somebody in the community, but I cannot remember who it was. But Because I didn't just come up with that one on my own. Yeah, I was surprised I had missed it. Yeah. I felt bad. I picked up a couple uh, books recommendations from uh, Fernando last episode. He had some really good books that I snapped up. I haven't started them yet. Now I'm reading yeah. Pirate of an Exquisite of Exquisite Mind, Explore Naturalist and Buccaneer Life of William Dampier. I have his journal, too. I really should read first, but this looks like an easier <laughs> way to get most of it. About another uh, classic English buccaneer book there. Pretty interesting. Uh, it goes through the first what, quarter of it I've read. Pretty much follows the South Sea adventure that uh, Blood and Plunder has as their that organized plague <laughs> thing that came out in 2020 and kind of didn't get the proper love it needed. Uh, so it's fun to review that again. Been keeping up my local group. It's been expanding. We got six players, pretty regular now, to the dismay and horror of the uh, Legion players who have to share tables with us. <laughs> 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 and we've been kind of going back and forth between playing like big games to play testing the six player games for Adepticon, which is fun because people who don't know the rules very well, it's easy to coach them and help them when you're on a team. And then last week, this week, rather, we played there's 100 point games. 1v1. We got to play two games in the evening. We're all playing the same scenario kind of side by side. It was a lot of fun to play a game. And then it was almost like a little tournament. Good fun. But I got to figure out how to let the guys who don't aren't very good or not very. I shouldn't say that. The guys who haven't played as long get some wins in it. Well, if they play long enough, they'll come. Yeah. <laughs> Just play logwood cutters and say you'll be the defender. That'll give them a chance. Drunk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What's that happened to me? <laughs> <laughs> And I've been working on Adepticon stuff. Uh, I should make a little announcement here. We're uh, moving into the Adepticon stuff. We're going to review all the events that are going to be hosted there, opportunities to play uh, Blood and Plunder in different formats and with different people. It uh, should be a really great weekend. Unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to be there this year. I was planning to. was there last year, but a family health situation that is going to be most prudent for me to stay home. So... I'm not going to be there to play all, run, help run all these events, but I'm going to help as much as I can from afar. And I'll have to learn that I'm not indispensable to the team. So you guys can't screw it up, okay? <laughs> well, like I said, it could it could fail. So you may still be indispensable. Nah. I kind of doubt it will, though. So uh, if you aren't going to Dipticon, sorry, this is a little bit boring. You can skip forward a little ways if you want. But uh, these are going to be some fun events. We're going to kind of go over some of the details. And some of them are already full. Some of them have some openings still. If you haven't registered, it's getting a little bit late when this comes out. We're going to release this in probably early March. The dates for Depticon, what is that? March 22nd through 5th, is that right? That weekend, Wednesday. I think we're starting events Thursday. Thursday, Friday, Saturday are our events. I believe it's the 20th through the 24th. Okay. Let's hit the tournaments first. We have three tournaments we're running for Firelock Games the Blood and Pigment team. There's a lot that we're going to talk touch on the other events that aren't for the pirate games, but we're going to look at these ones first. We've got three tournaments, the land tournament, the sea tournament, and the Oak and Iron tournament. Are any of you guys playing the land tournament? Or are you just going to help out with it? Or I know you all want to play in the sea tournament. I'm definitely playing in the land tournament. I'm going to try to play in the sea tournament. We've had to, since you've, since you've dropped out, we've had to kind of shuffle things around on who's running things. So I may be on the hook to run the sea tournament, but I'm definitely playing in the land tournament. So why don't you tell us about the land tournament and exactly what you're going to be playing for it? 
the land tournament's going to be the first tournament that shows up. It's going to be Thursday at 2 p.m. It's uh, 150 points, I believe, and we've got, what, 20-something people signed up for it right now? Yeah, 20-something. I'll look it up real quick and get the exact live number, but it's creeping up little by little. Plenty of spots still available on that, because I think we have, like, 40 spots available, but... Um, I'll be running some kind of Spanish list with good fight numbers. So <laughs> you don't have to tell us I was joking about that, but you can if you want. <laughs> I mean, it's fine. That means he's bringing like seventy uh, Milicianos. <laughs> no, probably. I, I'm 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 in between Spanish army and and mission garrison right now, probably for land. We got twenty four in the tournament right now. The Spanish army faction is one that I really like. They're fun to play on land. I do. I like them a lot. Yeah, Guy was playing a Spanish army faction at 100 points on Thursday and having a lot of fun with it. You can do, he had uh, two units of the Sultathos Reformados and then one big, bigger unit of Granadarios. Um, he was making stuff happen, even with small units, getting that <laughs> advantage out of the platoon action, even with three units, but they're pretty small units. But I'm always impressed how fun a 100 point game still is. It's small, but you still get a lot of fun and drama. Yeah. Then we can move on to Oak and Iron. Oak and Iron's going to be Friday at 5 p.m. I don't remember if I am signed up for the Oak and Iron tournament or not. I think I probably am. Uh, it is a little lagging in signups right now. So if you do, if you're if you're coming and you play Oak and Iron, sign up. It's going to be a good time. But I think it might only have. Do we have a live number on that? Look at now. Uh, we got six. Six. Right now. Okay, so not like terrible, but but still, little little lagging behind Blood and Plunder. I was going to play in that tournament. It's uh, last year it was funny. Both of the or the Blood and Plunder tournament. We just had a C tournament, and we had <laughs> a high proportion of people hadn't played before at all, or played not very much, or needed a loner force. And then everybody showed up for Oak and Iron. They all had their forces painted. They all knew the rules. Nobody needed any help. Jason had to answer like one question, which was embarrassing. That was the funny. The, that was my favorite moment from the whole con last year. Was when the two the two top players at the Oak and Iron table On looked the last over, at, like all both <laughs> at the same time, looked over to us and said, "How do you check for line of sight?" <laughs> That's <laughs> funny. Yeah, it's it's something. I guess. Uh, well, I mean, thinking about it, it probably doesn't come up all that often. But it was just funny hearing that from like the, this is the top table. One of these guys is to win the tournament. Yeah, <laughs> but then they're asking that. <laughs> yeah, it was just funny. But they were. That was a great crew. They uh, knew their yeah. stuff, and they just sat down and played their games and had a good time. Nice, tidy, and quality event. Jason's will be running that event. That event was almost a vibe that was one of the few that i got over there and got to hang out after the demo table and watch that being played and the fact that it was in the other building that year and the lower number of players and everyone knowing it that was the most chill tournament event i think i've ever seen and it looked like a lot of fun i was really jealous of that event <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. i was i think i was i wanted to play in it but i was just tired and just worn out at that point so that's why i was just i wasn't playing that i think i talked joe i think i talked you into playing one game of blood and plunder with me instead of playing in the okanai we were play testing a historical scenario and we decided to continue our play test and play more spanish mission games yeah. <laughs> rather than quit and play the tournament and then yeah jason and i were just playing some oak and iron on the side while he to he organized he uh, just kept up on the tournament it's pretty chill it's yep. great so if you play Orc and Iron, you definitely should jump into this tournament. Uh, we should mention that all these events for Blood and Plunder and Oak and Iron are in the Schomburg Ballroom of the main hotel. It was in the historical hotel last year, a different location, 10-minute bus ride away. But this year, they did get us in the main building. It's kind of weird because all the historical, the rest of the historicals are over in the other building, and all the other Firelock stuff is in the other building. But we're going to try it out. And it's kind of a favor that they gave us, so we're hoping it works out real well. Should be higher profile, easier to go straight from the vendor booth to the event place. But yeah, don't look for us in the same spot, different spot this year. 
I think it'll I think it'll have some pros and then probably some cons too, but we'll we'll see if we like it better or not. It'll be interesting anyway. Con cons. And what point level is the tournament? I, I think, think it's, it's 75, isn't it? I should look right here. It's right here. Um or did he up it? I think it was 75 last year. Yep, 75 points in each action. Okay. Yep. Ships of the line are allowed, so you can bring your third rate. You can bring your big galleon. Uh, you can bring any ship you want. 75 points. Those larger rated ships got a point de- decrease recently, didn't they? Yeah, so first, second, third rates all are cheaper than they used there to be. There you go. So all those big ships. Out. Bring them in wreck face. Oh, uh, reminding me here. For these tournaments, some experience is required. You can't come and never having played before. We'd love to build to make that an option, but it's really not fair for your opponent. They're, this is a really friendly crowd. Everybody's real nice. But if they come to a tournament ready to play their top game and they end up teaching someone how to play and maybe not getting through a whole game, um, it slows the tournament down. It kind of th- throws ranking and pairings, and it's probably not going to be the best experience for a brand new player either. So we are hosting a bunch of demos and open play events, which we're really happy to teach you how to play and get some games in. Shouldn't register for the tournament and play it if you've never played before and have no intention of playing at least a couple of games before the tournament. If you come to the convention, haven't played before, run a demo, play another couple games to get the basics of the game. That's great. Uh, but if you've never played before, it's going to be yeah. A little rocky, so it's not recommended. Oak and Iron's cool in that uh, you can just go up and you know buy a uh, starter set and have a fairly decent tournament list right there in the starter set. Mm-hmm. So, I love that. Yeah. yeah, isn't that one of the articles that Jason did for the blog, either for his or for you guys on Pigment? Yeah, if you're interested at all in the Oak and Iron tournament stuff, Jason posted a really great article. But I'm looking at his website right now, Oaken, or timberandsale.com. He has a new article called... Maybe it's not up yet. He might have been working on it. <laughs> Maybe I've just seen the preview. I think it's not up yet, but watch for it. It might be up by the time we post this, where he has like 12 viable tournament lists featuring various uh, levels of ships. Several of them are just in the core set. So if you kind of want some guidance on something that might be solid to play in a tournament, well, keep your eye on timberandsale.com for some great resources. Yeah, we've also got some event games going on through the convention. We have, we, we left the thing oh, out. Did we? Oh, oh, uh, oh, the oh sorry, 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 sorry. I was lo- I was looking that at that on the list, and I think I was thinking C, Oak and Iron C, right? Okay, we did that. Moving on. No, okay, C tournament. Dan, do you want to do you want to go All through? All the C players just turned off the podcast. <laughs> do you want to go through the C tournament for us, please? Uh, yeah, sure. So it's going to be a 200 point C tournament, and it's taking place Saturday at 5 p.m. I I know I'm playing in it for sure. It's my it's baby's first tournament. You'll be fine, and we will see how it goes. I'm pretty excited. This is the year I'm going to attempt to prove that I'm somewhat competent at the game. Then every year after this, I'm just going to make a really silly, stupid list and bring it and see how it goes. <laughs> I wouldn't worry about that too much. Prove you have fun playing the game. That's yeah. <laughs> as long as I'm not last. I feel like if I'm on last, I'm not allowed to write articles for us anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Just is going to stand over me and watch me read the book four times and smack me with a ruler anytime I got to get up and go to the bathroom. That's already on my to-do list. You're hyping this up <laughs> way too much. You're you're going you're gonna to wind up in this tournament yeah. rolling the worst you have in years. <laughs> That's why I have several, several bags of dice. <laughs> I'm a dice goblin. <laughs> don't get too worked up. Yeah. <laughs> Are you playing pirates? Um, of course, I, I have to. As the pirate commander this year, I kind of have to. And it was, I my list is good. I'm pretty good with it. Which one? I've seen like five different ones you sent me. Oh, I had so many that I was toying around with, and I've kind of settled on one. If my bark alonga gets here, I might bring that one, but we'll we'll see. If you have a plastic sloop, I'm sorry. <laughs> 200 points. There's the whole packet. All these events have pages up on uh, bloodandpigment.com. We have a Adepticon tab with uh, one page that has all the events. And then each of the events has some pa- a page with its own details and info specific. There's a tournament packet that tells you what scenarios we're going to play and time slots and everything like that. Uh, of interest, we've changed the scenarios. Historically, control the field 
and take and hold and encounter have been the scenarios that have been used frequently in tournaments. Is that fair? I, yeah, I think I think that's what we used last year, didn't didn't we? Yeah, is that what you guys used at Historicon a few times, Tyler? Do you know? When Glenn was running them, he almost always backed it down and just played encounter. <laughs> we really time. wanted to do the we really wanted to do the C tournament packet that Preston and I had been working on, and the intention was to get something that would be balanced. But we were going to take a much heavier hand at going through those scenarios and and tweaking them. Uh, the core scenarios in the core in the for C are kind of weird. A lot of them are like you win if you take the enemy's ship, <laughs> which is kind of obvious, which doesn't leave a lot of room for playing the scenario you just fight and this the setup is different with the setup mostly being the attacker starts up when the defender starts down when is that pretty much right yeah, yeah essentially yes if you're there's certain lists that if you're forced to deploy downwind your whole strategy kind of goes out the window which makes you build a little more flexibly but we've thrown a couple more in this year a couple from the raise the black book the chase's end and wanted man love a wanted man <laughs> but no optional rules, Dan. You can't get the free commander. I know. I know. <laughs> the best optional rule in the game. So we have five scenarios that you need to prepare for, and then the day of, you'll figure out which one you're playing. So encouraging people to play more well-rounded lists, play lists that can have answers for different deployments and different objectives, rather than building just for three specific lists. But we're probably tipping our hand here a little bit and probably going to use these as the black scenarios. So I uh, might want to take a look at those. If you don't have the Raise the Black book, they are included in the packet on our website, Blood and Pigment, if I got that link correct, which I'll check after this. But I think I got all the links updated, maybe missed one. And also kind of a big deal. If you're playing a Galleon, the gun deck subsection rules will not be used in the tournament. So if you're banking on that, you may want to tweak your list. I just wanted to mention that because I don't want someone to bring their $400 Galleon out planning on gun decks. So then, no. <laughs> it's still good without the gun decks. Yeah, it's still good. But we just let people know your gun decks are going to be assumed to be full of treasure with not enough room for guys. So <laughs> Packed with treasure. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, that's the big news, I think, on the... C tournament. That just leaves events, correct? Yeah. Moving on to events. So our first event on Thursday morning at 9 o'clock is going to be Morgan Attacks Panama. Uh, Joseph, you wrote this one. Well, you, you had a hand in writing all of these, but I think you exclusively wrote this one. Why don't you tell us a little bit about Morgan Attacking Panama? Sure. Yeah, this is kind of a stand-up and fight scenario. Pretty simple. And not a lot of terrain going on. Uh, you have Spanish defenders on one side of the table. Outside, the city of Panama is kind of a flat area. They fought the battle. You have very hungry uh, English buccaneers have marched all across the isthmus here, ready for some plunder and ready to kill some Spanish. Players can bring, it's 150-point forces is what we're asking for. I think 200 got one or two places, uh, maybe on the Adepticon website. So some people bring 200-point forces. Uh, we'll do a 200-point table and then 150-point table as necessary. Three players per side. All of these scenarios are going to be six-player tables, three players per side. So we're going to make four tables of each. we got 24 people signed up for all of these scenarios already. Should be a lot of fun. Uh, so on one side, uh, we request people to play Spanish factions. Um, if you want to be historically accurate, you can play Spanish militia. Or maybe Tercios are okay. Spanish Mission Garrison would be sort of would be fine. 17th century is optimal. Uh, historically, they were a mixed selection of some uh, just guys with weapons from the city. A lot of crummy militia, some real soldiers, a lot of native auxiliaries, cavalry. So if you have cavalry, Spanish cavalry, this is a great opportunity to bring it, at least as far as history goes. But if you want to bring an 18th century like Spanish army or anything from Raise the Black, that's okay too. Then the other side, you got the uh, Morgan's Force. Three players playing Buccaneer Forces. Morgan's personal Buccaneer Force would be great for the general using Henry Morgan as the commander. And then a French Buccaneers and English Buccaneers or Brother under the Coast would all be great options historically. Or you can play some other faction, even Blackbeard's faction, whatever you want. But historically, it would be optimal, in my opinion. But... <laughs> 
is the third player there to handle the cattle charge. I didn't put the cattle charge in. I didn't want to complicate it that much. <laughs> uh, Sorry. <laughs> Unless you want to give the English the bloated special rule. <laughs> 80 cows. You want to buy and paint 80 cows and get them on the table? You can get those cheap Playmobil ones. Well, not Playmobil. That's not cheap. Send anymore, me some but... cows. I'll just spray paint them white and then just blot speed paint spots on them. I'll get it done in the afternoon. I have 20 cows, but it took me a long time to. And I'm not done to them. They're too precious. <laughs> just pink nose and black splotches, and we're good. Yeah, it's an interesting battle. I hope people bring cavalry because that was a fun part of the battle. Uh, but most of it's just going to be open uh, terrain, a little bit of cover, but not very much. The English need to break through, so they need to move up. They have probably will have superior musketry, so they need to wade in and start knocking down Spanish. And the Spanish is there with their poorly equipped and hope for the best. There will be one hill on the Spanish right flank, which will have some special rules for the English got up there when they're able to kind of flank the the Spanish line and improved pretty key. So we have some special rules for that part. Some of the French buccaneers were the first to get up there and take that. So that's kind of the terrain element there. But should be a fairly simple, easy scenario where three people can work together and be on a team, Spanish versus English. Sounds good. That leaves us a Charleston raid. Charleston's going to be our amphibious event game. So it's not. it's kind of your atypical amphibious event game as in like there's not a complete seaside and and a complete land side so both both sides are going to have a land element and a sea element and uh as a team you're going to have to decide how much you know help you're going to give to each side of the battle that's going on simultaneously because each team is going to hopefully have a force that has boats and i think we're probably going to provide some of these boats for a force. I don't know if people have been turning in lists for this. Initially, my thought was, you know, have have a force with some boats and they can either go out, help the sea force, or they can land on land and go help the land element. And uh, I think there's going to be an objective on the land side. It's going to be a watchtower. I've play tested this one once and it was a lot of fun just at the beginning of the game. It'd be like, okay, what do I need to, what do I need to put where, where, where am I going to have an advantage? Where am I going to have a disadvantage type thing? And where am I okay with that? Yeah. So the force is set up. There's two British ships at sea and then there's a Spanish, a French ship and then a Spanish ship that's in boats ready to hit the beaches. They were, uh, load, unloading guys to make some sort of raid. It was a pretty disastrous really, uh, event. And then there's an English force and a Spanish force on land already. So you're going to have that tension of what does that middle force do, which is very unusual for a blood and thunder scenario. But yeah, that's going to be on Friday at 9 o'clock in the morning as well. Most of it looks like most of our event games happening in the morning. We're having a few demos and open plays throughout the day and then ending off the day with a tournament most days. Yeah, Jason did a great job scheduling. We have a event in the morning and then open play in that middle of the day and then a, a tournament on the latter half of the day every day. So easy to remember and hopefully get into your schedule. But for that event, as far as historical forces, you can see on the page on Blood and Pigment, but the uh, Spanish side has Spanish and French. So if you have a French list, you can bring it here. And the English side has English and quite a few uh, North American native uh, helpers there. So if you have a native force, you bring it to your tournament or something. It's a great time to use it there. And if you have Dutch or something, that'd be okay for English too. But Spanish, French, and English and natives are kind of the main factions that are historically ideal. But Yeah, the, it's funny. This one, the, the raid had already pretty much failed this was the tardy ship <laughs> that got lost and then eventually started landing guys that had no idea that the raid had failed <laughs> like four miles yeah north. i guess we'll get into this marsh <laughs> it's hard to find history out there there's not a lot written on right it. this was the raid that was originally started by eberville but he did not finish it out because he died in havana before it was getting built up to go kind of sunk the whole expedition. They had no real good yeah. leadership. It was a nightmare. And the weather didn't help them either. All of history could have been different. American history could have been different if Charleston was squashed right there. Yeah, yeah. Who knows? It's a lot of a lot <laughs> of uh, linchpin moments like that. 
But next we have the Escape from Nassau event on Saturday at 9 o'clock again. Fancy that. So this is um, Charles Vane making a run out of Nassau with the fire ships? Yes. Yeah, when Wood Rogers blockaded the harbor there. It's pretty cool. I I could be a very cool scenario. I played I played this one uh not too long ago and it was it was pretty fun. Um Did you though? I you? well listen, I I have to go <laughs> through it and get my get my I forgot things done so that I can I can do it better the day of. But no, yeah, I I messed up a little bit, I think on I don't think I messed up setup anyway. I think sometimes, m- most of the time when I'm playing a new scenario, I'll, I'll, I'll like screw up the setup somehow. And then, uh, I think it's a big Yeah. Deal. Yeah. It's annoying. This time I messed up the fire ship just because I didn't realize there were rules, different rules for fires on at sea. And so I didn't, I mean, it was on me cause I didn't do as much prep as I should have, but I, I got thrown into it and, and I was like, well, this is this is the night because it takes place at night. This is like the night rules, and so I'm assuming this works the same way as on land, but it doesn't. You can see ships further out because they're structures, and so that was that was messed up a little bit. And then um, Joseph has a rule in there about the fire ship causing uh, fatigue checks if it gets close to an English ship that I completely forgot about, but. Other than that, the scenario was fun, so it would be even more fun with if you actually played it correctly, which we will do at Adepticon. It's really great that you're playing through them beforehand. It's it's, it's going to help me immensely. So you kind of know what to watch more. I think I might actually be available for that one if you need an extra player. I'm just looking at the schedule here, <laughs> and the only thing I have on Saturday is the C tournament at five. Well, we we may need you to, to help run a game. I'm I'm okay with that. Let me let me know. I think I've just put it out there. Said put me where you need me. I only have the Valor and C tournaments on things I want to do. So just put me where you want me. So for this scenario, you need three pirate players with 200 point lists. Pretty simple. You can use your tournament list if you're playing pirate it's a faction of some sort. Or one of them needs to have this fire ship, which costs a few points, pretty cheap. But just a couple guys on a size two or three ship, brigantine is historically optimal. And then the English, they're a little weirder. You can do it. 200 point ship of any flavor and then we want to get a sixth rate on each table because they have some pretty substantial ships and the sixth rate will have basically two forces on it like a marine forces and soldiers and then some a bunch of artillery scenario happens at night with the english kind of just anchored snoozing away and then and we spiced up the history a little bit here they just sent a fire ship out and scattered the english fleet and didn't attack at all and then just snuck out of the back of the harbor the next day. So they never faced the English face-to-face, but this is just... But the fire ship was uh, considerable and terrifying. Nobody likes to get burnt up on on the ocean, it turns out. So this is spiced up. But yeah, a playtest was really fun. We have the English trying to scramble, to, uh, cut their anchors, and get moving before the fire ship hits them. As the fire ship gets closer, the units start to panic and lose control, which is a lot of fun. And the pirates, if they get hit with a broadside, they're going to really hurt in their dinky sloops, whatever they're sailing versus a fully uh, equipped sixth rate or light frigate. But the English are pretty busy trying to not get burned at the same time. So it was a fun, fun balance when we played it. I hope everybody has fun with it. Yeah, it sounds more like the telling of it out of Black Sails, from what I'm hearing. I don't know what that show is. I, I've never heard of it. I can I can hear you lying. <laughs> <laughs> I don't remember that. I don't remember that scene. I haven't watched. I keep watching it while I'm painting. It's kind of exactly how it. you described it. They have the fire ships go, and the English are panicking to just get the hell out of the way. But but re- really, the point is, we have to borrow from Hollywood to make the 18th century interesting. Is what you're saying? Because it's exactly. so bad. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I was going to make that exact point. <laughs> Yeah, I think he's sitting on the deck, and the guy's like, oh, cut the cables to the approaching schooner, and Boyd's Rogers glares up and says, cut the damn cables now. <laughs> so does that leave the non-plunder-specific events? Um, yeah, we've got Waggers. I think I'm saying that right. Waggers action. 
I say wagers, but I have no basis for that. Waggers wager, something like that. That's the first time I've ever had to say it out loud. And I'm just like, uh, maybe it is a cool scenario. I think Jason wrote it. It's for Oak and Iron. That's happening Saturday at 9 a.m. But I don't think very many people are signed up for it. It'll happen with one table or two tables or however many we, however many we do. So, yeah, it was pretty substantial action. Um, Spanish lost a ton of treasure in this. You have some big ships. They're going to showcase some of the new ships from uh, the Oak and Iron Line, the Galleon, and the Third Rate. Yeah, specifically the San Jose that actually took part in this. Yeah, I recommend people jump on it. Last year, all the Oak and Iron scenarios were full, and this year they haven't filled up yet. So I recommend people avail themselves as an opportunity. Jason always makes some beautiful tables and runs a tight ship. Past that, we've got some Blood and Steel stuff run by Fernando, uh, specifically like a Texas Texas Revolution thing. I think he was talking about that on the last podcast, wasn't he? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that that should be really cool. Um interested to see that and then i think tyler you've got some info on the blood and crown stuff don't you yes these were set up like i said before i knew that i was going to be able to go but john lundberg volunteered to run several blood and crowns events i think he's running them two a day and he has forces to provide he also said that if you want to reach out to him and bring your own forces he'd be amenable to that he is providing forces for players who are coming up and have not seen the game and just want to see what it's all about. Okay. It's so like a demo event sort of thing, kind of combo. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of these narrative events are this way. I don't know, Joseph, if you were planning for, for new players to be able to do like the attack on Panama. Yes. These events are okay for brand new players. As long as you're okay, getting pushed around a bit, we do have uh, some loaner forces available, but they are on a first come first surf basis. We can't provide 24 loaner forces. Especially now that Joseph is not coming, we may run out of minis. Usually, usually you can, I think Dan said this before, you can like go over and shake Joseph and he'll, he'll have a force fall out of him. Yep. If you just turn him upside down, assuming you're tall enough to turn him upside down and shake him like you're shaking out milk money, all manner of minis will just fall out of his pockets. And historical coins. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I should have mentioned, uh, speaking of, we would really... Love it if you registered your forces and some uh, on our website. We have a kind of a tally there so we can try to match people up and get events as organized as we can before the day of. Because if you show up and we you don't have a force and we don't know that, or you have a force that is illegal, we have to help you out with that, or just we'd like to get things lined up as you can. So if you go to the Adepticon page on our site, there's a, a little registration page. I know you can register an Adepticon, but that doesn't give us anything until the week of and it doesn't give us your force or anything so if you can just give us your force and details and what you want to play for these events it's massively helpful for us to get the game started promptly and efficiently and help everybody have a good time so each of these events except for the open play stuff if you can tell us you're coming tell us what you want to play tell us if you need a loaner force really appreciate it yeah then i saw on the schedule a Blood and Valor tournament on Friday at 10 a.m. I'm sure Rufus is running that. Um, I think, Dan, you you were playing in that, weren't you? Yep, I'm playing in that. Um, I did just put out, I'm going to toot my own, my own horn here, um, there is a free supplement out for the Russo-Japanese War for Blood and Valor that did go live. If that's something you're interested in, those, those lists on the Firelock page, they're on the website. You can go to the Downloads tab. Those are tournament legal. So if that's something you're interested in, feel free to bring it up. I would love to see somebody playing my new crazy Japanese that I made. That'd be they're gonna be super awesome. Congratulations on helping out and making something cool and getting it published. Thank you. Yeah, it was a labor of love, a lot of research. I shared it with Tyler beforehand and he thought it was just as hilarious <laughs> because it was really kind of a dry run of World War One that not a lot of people pay attention to. But yeah. I'm going to be there. I don't know if I'll be playing my own Russians from the Russo-Japanese War or the Imperial Russians. I'm still kind of feeling that out. But I will be there. I will be playing a Russian force. And hopefully I don't scare people off with the sheer amount of dumb conscripts I'm bringing. Because <laughs> you either have less conscripts or your problem is solved. That supplement you worked on is going to be part of the next expansion book, right? Yeah, um, it's going to be covering, well, as of right now, the rumor is it's going to be covering both pre- and post-war conflicts up until possibly the Spanish Civil War. 
So it will be in there because me and Tyler wrote up some scenarios and they're not in the in the initial supplement right there, but they will be in the next book. Cool. Cool. Yeah, there is a there's a write up of that over on on my blog. So if anyone is not tired of me by the end of this, uh, you can find that on deadmanschest.org. And I believe that is the most recent article that I have up is the kind of a review and also a little tidbit on the Russo-Japanese War because it is a very interesting dry run of World War I with all of the carnage and mechanization that you would see about five years later in Europe. And nobody paid attention. <laughs> nope. No one learned anything from this. <laughs> How many points is that? I believe it's 200. 200. That is 200 points. It's about the standard for Valor. And I know armored cars are legal. Tanks are not. And Rufus likes to run a luxurious schedule with a game and then a lunch and then another game and then cocktails and order Break for cigars. Another... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm just going to play for the first half. I'm going to eat my dry powdered borscht right out of the package and then just put it in my mouth, some water, shake it up and swallow and then go right back to gaming is what I'm hearing. Good comrade. <laughs> Beat is good for you. Put hair on chest. <laughs> Keep you warm in cold Chicago weather. Then uh, I think uh, I think one of the big things everybody's been talking about in the community right now is uh, Port Royal coming out. Um, and I believe Adepticon will be the first time that Anybody gets to play that if you're not play testing it. So demo, I don't. I guess that'll be at the booth, probably demos of Port Royal. Yes, Firelock will be there with the booth. Yeah, that'll probably be the first time I see that. Want to try it out? But that's a good segue into demos, Tyler. I know. I know. Last year you were the demo machine at Adepticon. <laughs> I was stuck on that table all weekend. <laughs> I, I like running demos, but I did not envy you doing it nearly the entire time. The grizzled veteran of demos. Yeah. <laughs> so I've run quite a few demos too, but nothing like you. Whenever I start a demo, I'm like, I don't know where to start. I'm like, uh, these are your guys, and you cut them into units, and then you have these dice, and you can turn people off pretty fast. Yeah, that's after the hour-long lecture of history you do, right? Two hours, but yeah. Oh, two hours. Okay, <laughs> yeah, my mistake. The hesitation mistake. there meant it was at least two and a half hours. <laughs> He's like, "Yeah, an hour. We'll go with just an hour." Yeah. <laughs> you see, these coats have exactly forty-three buttons. Isn't that cool? Well, this is why around, this, they're, they're gone. this is why this time period is important for you know history. <laughs> but you've done a ton of demos, and uh, you wrote an article for the. Uh, uh, quartermaster the quartermasters newsletter which i was really impressed with and i uh, really appreciate experience and i i watched you work there and share your wisdom with us how do you uh, uh, approach a demo and how can um, everybody else listening yeah. who wants to give a demo to people in their stores do that without making people die a little bit inside <laughs> so that's kind of the first thing is knowing where you're going to run it because they're running it at a convention and I'm somewhat guilty of this. I would let the demos run longer at the convention than I probably should have. You can, I mean, for a convention, you want people to come up, hit the booth, play a couple turns, decide if they like the game, hopefully go pick up a copy or go sign up for an event. At a game store, you can play out the entire game. At home, you can play out the entire game. The conventions, though, I mean, you have to be quick and, and really get through your, your conventions. To assist with that speed, that's sort of extras to bring, like your your player aids. I like having the cards on the table, the unit cards. Joe, you talked about getting people into the game quickly. I use the unit cards for that because it shows, I tell everyone it's a D10 system. These are your stats. You're trying to roll higher than that. You can go straight from those stats into the training level, which is printed there at the top of the card. Show people the way that the activation system works with the card draw and you can have people playing if you practice it you can get that spiel down to like a minute or two really that's all anyone needs to know how to play i always try and jump them in by saying you tell me what you want to do and i will show you the rules to make that happen rather than trying to explain 
this is how you shoot in case you want to shoot. So you find those player cards pretty valuable? Yeah, the unit cards especially. I don't normally keep the quick reference sheet because it presents a lot of information to people. And the unit cards kind of have the same problem. If they flip them over and they start reading ahead and they see things like fast reload or right. war cry, it's like, no, we'll get to those when we get to those. Or the ruthless text that's like 700 words long. <laughs> yeah. Yes, exactly. And that kind of, I like to keep the forces really simple to avoid that. The starter forces out of the, the raise the black box are what Firelock uses for demos. I'm sure that's what they'll be using at the booth at Adepticon. And those are really great, except Blackbeard has a ton of rules. Maynard has the rule to go prone. So I normally use them as zero point commanders and and just go from there. Yeah, layering commander rules on top of it. A little much. Yes. And then those ships are a, a bit heavy on artillery. Four swivels off the bow of their ship and you've only got 12 guys on your ship can be a little rough. Yeah, just a bit. <laughs> yeah. So I, I normally I normally run maybe two swivels for those forces, but if you're running your own lists, if if you know you have a friend that wants to play French and you decide that you're gonna demo a French force, just keep the forces simple. Kind of the same thing, like don't grab Iberville the same way that you're not gonna want to grab Blackbeard. Just too many rules. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. The way I've been doing it at demo stores is exactly what you've been saying. Is I've been doing this for quite a while, and same thing. I just grab usually maybe a commander with one special rule, and I highlight it on the sheet. I print the sheets out beforehand, and I always have them with me. And that is that. That is it. Just easy, simple. Keep it simple. Easy to get get on the table and playing. I was going to ask how many units you like to run. I keep it really simple. Like even at C, I I want to run about three units. If you're running at C, running three units is best because that means they move on every card. Yeah, exactly. A, yeah. Mm -hmm. I also like when I, I, I also do three units per demo force. I also like to do an inexperienced, trained, and veteran yep. uh, unit per force so that I can sh clearly show, you know, like, okay, this unit's going to get this many actions on this card, this unit's going to get this many actions, and this unit's going to get this many actions. It kind of shows that aspect really well if, if you can get that in a list. I know some factions, if you're, if you're trying to make a demo list for, it's hard, to, it's hard to get that. But For the convention, I usually run everything as trained, just so that I don't... Like, I will explain that when I show the cards. Like, this is your unit's training level. They're... You know, these guys are trained. There are also veteran and inexperienced units. But then once we're playing, they don't have to keep track of that. It's just everybody is trained. Use that middle number. For game store stuff and home, if you're playing a full game, definitely I would run, like, an inexperienced unit of sailors or something. Like a melee unit. So that they have to get in and see the fighting rules the same way. Yeah. Same thing for like if I'm running a land unit, I'll usually have a dedicated melee unit to to try yeah, to force them to to do some sort of fighting. Uh, but no, I totally yep. get the doing all all trained, especially in a booth con setting to where you're like trying to get in and out and maybe like 15 minutes at the most. Mm -hmm. Just like like so you don't have a line of people standing over you being like, hey, can I can I play next? Can I play next? because <laughs> i've been there i've been yeah, there. i've been that person that's year. like that, like hanging around a booth being like uh okay can i <laughs> are they about finished i kind of really want to try this i also don't want to just stand yeah. around and stare at people for a long time <laughs> <laughs> yeah and the trying to run a scenario in 15 minutes kind of to that point i try to only run maybe two or three turns at a convention with a really easy win con, like just get a unit onto the other guy's deck and have it stay there. Uh, because the boarding rules, obviously, there are a couple activations where you're Schrodinger's unit between ships. Is there a scenario that you guys run when demoing that you guys like? Because I normally, for C, it's real easy to do the deck thing, or for land, like be the closest one to this well. Um, usually when I'm doing it at the store, I can afford to get through a whole game. So I like Encounter, and then recently I've been doing A Wanted Man. 
and just running the basic the stuff out of the starter box and saying, hey, this is Lieutenant Maynard, who's basically just been an English commander at this point. His job is to go and get Blackbeard. Blackbeard, you want to get the hell out of there or kick his ass. <laughs> so you don't run the actual, like, raise the black scenario. You do the just a wanted man. Because they have Blackbeard's last stand. Yeah, they do. It's a little difficult. I've played it a few times, and I have issues with it. <laughs> so I mainly just run them as just I have pirates with Blackbeard standing in as a commander, then Maynard. I run them as, like, I think British Navy, and then have them running as a standard British commander. That's what everybody seems to, you know, associate as pirates versus the British Navy. And if I'm feeling spicy, I'll do a 17th century demo, and I'll have, like, maybe French buccaneers and a Spanish guy. And I'll have the really cool characters on there that nobody knows about and then have them scrap an encounter and just have them, you know, brawl with each other. Mm -hmm. I find that, especially with the 17th century list, mirroring forces. So they both have, you know, a cannon and a boarding capability allows people to kind of some people you'll see catch on really quick. They'll go, oh, wait, I want to board that ship and I have units to do that. Or some people will say, I just want to stay back and shoot with cannons. <laughs> Yeah, trying to force the issue to go in and board or to use cutlasses can be really tricky if they, if they just want to stand off and shoot. Oh, that's my bane with land demos is people, everybody wants to stand back and shoot. So I usually say, all right, these guys are your crack melee guys. You want to get them up through cover and start whacking heads with them because they're no good back here. Because if I just make a gun list, everybody wants to stand back, you know, at board shooting each other on nines and tens. And that's no fun. <laughs> There's a lot of different kind of demos you can run, and that's becoming apparent here. When I run a seed C demo for two players who haven't played before, with a full length game possible, I'll give people asymmetric forces, one with cannons and one without any. So then I have somebody learning how to do the cannons, and they want to stay back, and I have somebody with light small arms trying to rush in, gives everybody a chance to see what's going on uh, on these different forces but makes people try to do different things. But that's not good for a 15-minute demo, but I've had good that's success with that. That's kind of how the um, that's how the booth demo is set up. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I didn't... I mean, when I was running at Adepticon, I didn't set that up. I showed up, I walked in to get my badge last year, to <laughs> and they weren't going to let me in onto the floor because I arrived. I drove, I got there a little bit late, and I went to the check-in desk to pick up my badge, Mike had it at the Firelock booth, which doesn't help me because I can't <laughs> get to the booth without the badge. <laughs> Just carry a ladder. You'll be fine. Yeah, that's what I ended up doing was like, I was like, oh, okay, I'll, um, I'll just go wander off here and see if I, I shouldn't say this because they're, now they're not going to let me in. Um, <laughs> I said I would wander off and I'd try and reach out and get my badge. And I, I kind of did like the pump fake and just dodged through the door. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But, but I did end up getting my badge. But as soon as I walked in, Mike's like, yeah, can you run this demo for me? And that was it. That was the next three to four days of my life. <laughs> <laughs> but he had it set up with Blackbeard, and it was very much like Maynard had all of the fun toys, and Blackbeard just had Cutlasses and Warcry. <laughs> <laughs> Cutlasses, Warcry, and a dream. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So if you think for selling the game, do you think land or sea is better? I would always push for sea because it's such a spectacle. There are a lot of games that do land skirmishes. Mm -hmm. I think people are kind of scared of the sea battles, but people always come over to the table for the sea battles. Like that's what hooks everyone in. And then when they when they've bought in and they have the boat and they have to build it and rig it <laughs> and learn how to play with it, <laughs> then they kind of get cold feet. <laughs> When I'm doing it at the store, I usually start off because, you know, if someone because the way I run it is, you know, I'm there every Thursday with my group and I always put feelers out and say, hey, you know, if anybody wants to demo, you know, because the store is a discord message me or put here in this channel and I will show up with forces. So I usually start because I'm in a game store scenario or place. I used to you start with land because land's a little bit easier to kind of get your feet wet. And then usually somebody will say, all right, you know, you like the game. All right, we'll come back next week and we will play C. Because it's, uh, it's the same thing, but it's a little more complicated. And I've had great success with that. i kind of not sure if it is more complicated or not because of the cover and movement rules. You do have to learn how to run a ship. And you have to touch on maybe some annoying things like difficult maneuvers. But if you have your guys in a ship, 
They aren't running around. You have to measure your four inches or three inches. Your People just seem to get around. hung up on when the ship moves and then how like cover and all that works. So again, because I don't do it at a con, I do it at a store. I usually start with land with some really just like trees and cover and that's kind of like the tiptoe because usually people ask for a demo when people see us playing at sea and they'll say yeah i'll come back next week for a demo and i'll be like all right so do you want to play on land or at sea and i'll usually kind of push for land is because it's again i think it's easier to learn the whole game on land and then go over to sea and i've had a lot of success with that i have i've had a couple players who are still regulars because they started off on land and now do sea i'm not trying to criticize or disagree i'm just saying that, that I'm oh no! I will. <laughs> sometimes it's easier. Uh, uh, there's less little fiddly things to touch on on C because you always have cover, and you don't have to deal with different types of terrain or buildings. You just have a ship you're in, and you move the ship. Uh, it it just changes the focus. You learn different things, but I have become less convinced that it's simpler on land, even though it appears that way. I think it gives new players maybe the warm and fuzzies because I usually give my new players a, an option. Like, like you said, Dan, I'll, I'll ask them like, do you want to, which, which way do you want to play first land or sea? And most like, like 99% of the time they'll, they'll be like, Oh, land. Because I think, I think it's just like most other war games are played on land. So it's like, Oh well, I'll know land probably better, you know. More familiar. Yeah, I'll be more familiar with land. So, kind of agree that it, it trades some complications. Mm -hmm. And then, kind of a shout out to to my group, especially Martin, if you're listening. Um, last year during Summer of Plunder, we had quite a few people show up to do demos, and I gave them lists, and we were doing kind of. I think it was during Fifty Point Week, so we were just had like four tables. We were rotating tables with different weather effects. And I told everyone beforehand that, hey, we had a couple of new players coming, so I'm going to need more than one person to help demo because we're all going to be rotating tables to log games. And all my guys are good, but Barton specifically is so good at running and explaining demos. That it's not just about the game. It's about, you know, kind of upselling it when, oh, yeah, your guys shot and you killed three of my guys and they're just slaughtered. And people really like it when if you're into the game, they kind of get into it. And it was great. I was afraid that, you know, having two new people playing in a 50 point kind of rotating thing was going to be hard, but he kicked ass and I really, really appreciate him. <laughs> I always find myself narrating the games. Yep. <laughs> and I, I find it helps to explain rules, too. Like with Resolve, you know, someone gets someone gets a shot off, they, they drop a pirate, but the other player rolls their Resolve and passes on both dice, and I'm like, oh yeah, they didn't like that guy anyway, he drank all the rum and cheated at cards. The rule for, for being limited to how many saves you can roll, depending on the number of men in the unit. So like in melee, I'll explain it. I'm like, you know, it's someone coming up and stabbing you in the back. You're fighting this guy one on one and it's totally fair, but you can't account for that guy skulking around in the background. So narrating the rules in a way that makes sense mm -hmm. as more than just, all right, pick up 4D10, roll them and look for all the ones that are a six or higher. Be colorful, be weird. I think, Dan, are you bringing Kit for, uh, for Adepticon? Are you going to... Um, I'm bringing a hat because I'm going to be wearing my pigment shirt proudly, but I will be wearing a hat, and Which I know hat? it'll be probably be cold. I need to know. Hmm? The fuzzy Shanka. Oh, of course it's going to be fuzzy. <laughs> you know how cold it gets? I'm a Texas boy. You know how cold it gets up there? I'm bringing my freaking fuzzy hat, and I'm bringing my wool buccaneer coat. <laughs> I'm going to be freezing. <laughs> Is it Russian? Of course. It's got a little shit pin on it, and it's got a, a eagle feather in it. <laughs> It's on my mini. <laughs> <laughs> my fiance just walked in and told me I better be wearing the hat when I go. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, telling the story is a big deal. Yeah. Yeah. I learned how to do that from my first Games Workshop demo when we went into a Games Workshop in the Orange Mall and the guy had us play a demo and he was into it and narrating. And that's kind of how I do it now. <laughs> It would be really boring to spend as much time running events as or running demos as you can, like to just do an event in a store and run three or four demos or like be sitting at the booth at the convention running demo after demo after demo if you don't be a little bit crazy with it. 
and I like to play, I play with the rule of cool a lot. So I'll strip down all kinds of, you know, I don't teach the advanced maneuvers. I don't bother with that. Most people aren't going to need them in a demo. You won't normally see raking shots, but one of the demos at Adepticon, a player had the opportunity and their opponent really maneuvered very badly. I'm sorry if they hear this, but they were, they were asking about raking shots and I'm like, well, your cannons aren't loaded. So if you'll forgive me while we do some really cheesy advanced rules, I can make sure that you get that cannon volley off and, and see what a raking attack does. Motivating hot swapping. Uh... Oh, it was. No, we Jank. absolutely hot swapped a character. <laughs> oh, like you're going to abandon these guns. Blackbeard's going to tell these guys to get on it and reload. <laughs> The rule of cool. If you get a raking shot, I'm not going to be like, sorry, you can't do it. No, get it. <laughs> I want to see the carnage. I've done that too, yeah. <laughs> when a player realizes they have bayonets and wants to fix them and charge, I encourage that wholeheartedly. <laughs> yeah, the other game was um, someone had their ship catch on fire. I was playing a big, a big participation game and a kid like got nailed with artillery fire and his ship was just completely ablaze and he's like can i sail it into the other people and i'm like yeah go for it <laughs> fire doesn't usually spread like that but like we're gonna we're just gonna do it <laughs> no one saw you roll that 10 it absolutely spreads to their deck <laughs> but just to make the game entertaining and and you want people walking away from the table having a good time Mm -hmm. anything yeah. that you're going to do we're there to play games that's the main thing you want to have the person that you're demoing to have a good time so i think that's i think that's the main the main goal with running any any kind of demo for any game really so know your setting how much time do you got know what they're expecting how deep do they want to jump in Know your game, know your basic rules, keep it in a controlled environment so nothing that you don't know <laughs> was going to pop up. And then tell the story, make it fun, and maybe squeeze some extra fun out by stretching the rules if it's going to highlight something awesome. Yeah. Yeah. If you do that, you're going to have a really successful demo and hopefully bring new players into the game because that's the other reason that we're there to do these. Yeah. Right. And if you're trying to build a community at your game store, it could be hard if you just got you and maybe somebody else who hits every month or so. But yeah, if you have somebody willing to do a demo, you don't want to mess it up. You want As soon as you get that critical mass of two, three, four players where it's happening regularly, it can kind of get itself going. But those starting from nothing is hard and you want to make good use of any opportunity you get. Yeah, getting that toehold of the first three players, I think is is critical and if you're gonna go if you're gonna do demo days for a store definitely if you hear about a store getting product if they're gonna start stocking firelock do them a favor and go in there and get players for them so they can sell some firelock <laughs> yeah uh, or it won't yeah. last huh? yeah or it's not gonna last and they're not gonna restock it so yeah i i try to go in and run demos if they if they've just placed an order but also if you're just in there gaming with your friends if you can get to about three people and have a regular night where, where you're getting the game in front of other players, be willing to rope those people in and demo that, demo to them. Don't, don't just yeah. play your game with your buddy and then and bounce. Like, I've given up my seat in the middle of a game to have a new player like, hey, my force is a dumpster fire, but here, if you want to play out the last like three turns of this, mm -hmm. I can show you how this game works. And then eventually maybe start finding them an opponent. <laughs> the six-player games we've been playtesting have been a good opportunity to pull people in who might not be ready to play a force on their own, but with a little coaching and being on a team helps out. So that's been yeah, an interesting game. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there was a, there was a player uh, when I ran the Charleston game. Pulling double duty, I was running two two forces because we only had five players. But there was a guy that came in that was interested, and I talked him in. I was like, "Play this other force, like you're doing me a favor. Just, just, <laughs> just play this other force." And he's he's been uh, he's been playing with us uh, since then. So that's awesome. I wouldn't have you six player, four player is good too. The the big games, the convention games and stuff, can be a really good way to bring in new players. I did. The convention game that I ran for Perico, I kind of followed the same 
advice, you know, keeping the forces really simple, keeping everything kind of flat so that new players coming in could get an opportunity to play it. But also if, if it makes it easy to run a demo in 15 minutes, it makes it easy to get through a narrative game in the, you know, two or three hour time slot, whatever you've got allotted. For big games, my biggest thing to be careful of, especially for a demo, is make sure you set up so everyone gets part of the action. <laughs> Don't set up somebody 8 inches, 12 inches behind everybody else so they're just moving all game and don't get to play anything. So be careful of that. That's what happened to me in our big game at Historicon, Joe. You set me up behind all the other two players. I did not. <laughs> <laughs> I have five witnesses. <laughs> Yeah, five character witnesses that I skulked around <laughs> in the back and gave orders. <laughs> like a that good British general. <laughs> Governor Winslow. It's getting it's getting on to one o'clock where I am, so I'm just coming to life here. Yeah, well, <laughs> I'm I'm gonna die soon, so <laughs> <laughs> Joe's a vampire confirmed. <laughs> But What's yeah, up? we've got we've got a few announcements. Uh, we've of course we've been talking about it. Adepticon is coming March twentieth to the twenty fourth. Sign up if you're coming. We'd love to see you there. I am going to be at Gen Con on August first through the fourth. Uh, right now, the plan is I think we're going to have one event game and then some open play stuff. Gen Con's not a like like I look at Adepticon as being like a like a all firelock convention for me gen con i go for myself i'm not going to be all gung-ho firelock but i am going to help run some run some stuff for them while i'm there and then we've got the painting contest going on right now when this comes out i think what what is going to be the categories for march joseph yeah we're just finishing up february here with terrain and open iron ships march uh, we're going to be uh, focusing on the units so your most the biggest category, really. Paint a unit, submit it via the painting contest tab on the Blood and Pigment website. Uh, we'll have a gallery with all the entries there. It's fun to see that grow and all the models get painted. Uh, yeah, so submit your units during March, and we'll get some prizes at the end of March for those. Okay. And then after that, because I think April is the last month for the painting contest. Am I right? Yep, April. Uh, we're focusing on ships, and then... A battle force, so 25 models plus kind of your collection of whole, maybe army or uh, starter box. So that's kind of a big category you're building up to. And then ships are obviously a big project. It takes a while too. So that's our last month. And then we'll have some extra prizes besides those two categories at the end of the contest in early May. Yeah. And then we'll slide on into Summer of Plunder after that, starting in probably, yeah. probably June. soon after that. And we'll see if Spain can repeat. Yeah. So this is the year of everybody gangs up on Spain. Nah, it won't happen. <laughs> yeah, we're still in the trenches doing the playtest of the new system. I think it'll be fun. Looking forward to Summer of Plunder. Yeah. If it is anybody's year, I think it's natives this year because the way the campaign system works, they are not disadvantaged. And in the yeah, playtesting nobody... right now, they are kind of kicking people around a bit. <laughs> Not good. <laughs> At least the last I checked their updates. And thank you, Tyler, for coming on and uh, hanging out with us. It was fun. Yeah, thanks for having me. Oh, Tyler, are you going to get that uh, article that you wrote? You're going to put that on your blog soon? The demoing article? Yeah. Yeah, I can definitely run that. Um, I, I've meant to be... I didn't want to come here and plug the blog a whole bunch. Uh, you can. It's fine. But I... Do it. Plug yourself. You're on. important. Th thank you. I guess earlier jokes about hot seats. Um, <laughs> no, so you can you can find me over on deadmanschest.org. Pigment definitely has all of the great blood and plunder content. My blog tries to cover a little bit of everything. I'll run some Valor articles. I've been trying to hit crowns really hard. But I will definitely put up the article on demoing. And I've also got some other stuff that I've been working on. I didn't mention it in the that I've been working. So I have other articles that do need to go up, prizes to announce, and so forth. Yeah, someone owns me in Eberville. Yeah, you'll get that in March. <laughs> <laughs> Just bring it to Adepticon, I'll throw it in my case. 
That is the plan. It's painted. I'm currently looking at it sitting on my mantle right now so that I don't forget to throw it in a, a luggage. He needs to sit next to I- Ibervilski. <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> it's time for this podcast to end, Garrett. Yep. <laughs> So for more information on Blood and Plunder, you can go over to bloodandpigment.com and check out all the material we have over there. We have articles on ships, nations, factions, terrain, painting guides, battle reports, anything you can think of, really. You can go check it out over there. And you can check out our slow-moving YouTube channel as well. We're getting some stuff up there, but it's kind of slow lately. And if you appreciate our content here on the podcast or on the blog or on YouTube or at Adepticon, uh, we do have a Patreon that we appreciate any contributions to. We end up spending a lot of money on this, and it's nice to have some of that offset. And we really appreciate that if you are so inclined. Patreon.com slash Pigment. And as always, keep your nice sweaty the wind at your back, your horror.